say you'll never forget where you were when you heard the news on September 11th, 2001. Neither will I. I was on the 110th floor in a smoke-filled room with a man who called his wife to say goodbye. I held his fingers steady as he dialed. I gave him the peace to say, Honey, I'm not going to make it. But it's okay, I'm ready to go. I was with his wife when he called as she fed breakfast to their children. I held her up as she tried to understand his words. And as she realized he wasn't coming home that night, I was in the stairwell of the 23rd floor when a woman cried out to me for help. I've been knocking on the door of your heart for 50 years. I said, of course, I'll show you the way home. Only believe in me now. I was at the base of the building when the priest ministered to the injured and devastated souls. I took him home to tend his flock in heaven. He heard my voice and answered. I was on all four of those planes, in every seat, with every prayer. I was with the crew as they were overtaken. I was in the very hearts of the believers there, comforting and assuring them that their faith has saved them. I was in Texas, Kansas, London, I was standing next to you when you heard the terrible news. Did you sense me? I want you to know that I saw every face. I knew every name, though not all know me. Some met me for the first time on the 86th floor. Some sought me with their last breath. Some couldn't hear me calling to them through the smoke and flames. Come to me, this way, take my hand. Some chose, for the final time, to ignore me. But I was there. I did not place you in the tower that day. You may not know why, but I do. However, if you were there in that explosive moment in time, would you have reached for me? September 11th, 2001 was not the end of the journey for you. But someday your journey will end, and I'll be there for you as well. Seek me now while I may be found. Then, at any moment, you know you're ready to go. I will be in the stairwell of your final moments. Good morning on September 11th, 2011. This is a day that our people, our nation, in many ways the world, will forever remember as amongst, if not the most tragic day in our history. 
at least within a couple of generations. And I want to tell you today as we continue in our series called Gospel, as we walk through the book of Romans, that you will never ever understand September 11th if you do not understand God's love. You will never ever understand September 11th if you do not understand sin. You will not understand this day or the evil or the struggles or the suffering in our world that is real if you do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something up front this morning that may take you a little bit off guard and that is suffering is a story told out of the foundation of love. Love. Last week, if you were here, as we looked at Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17, I shared with you something that was disturbing for many, and I told you up front, I fully expected many, many, to not like the truth that came. Last week, you see, the message was simply this, that there is an obligation. Romans chapter 8, verse 12, we have an obligation and that obligation, as we saw, spelled out in verse 17, was to embrace a willingness to suffer for Jesus, the Christ, for his gospel. Not that everybody would be called to suffer in the most heinous and difficult ways, but that we shared a calling to embrace a willingness to say, no matter what, yes, Lord. Well, this morning we're going to walk through verses 16 and 17 again and add to them verse 18 from Romans chapter 8 in a message that I have entitled Grace and Glory for Sin and Suffering. Last week it was important in the text that we had that there was an understanding that there must be a willingness to suffer for the gospel of Christ, a willingness to suffer for Christ whether it's in public ridicule and being ostracized in social circles or as we saw if you were like our North Korean brothers and you were squished under the weight of a cement roller because you would not be willing to denounce Christ. There is a call on every believer's life to embrace suffering. This week, as we now add verse 18... It's my prayer that you will gain an understanding of what really takes place in biblical suffering. And I tell you, while I pray none will necessarily be insulted, I pray that most of all of us will find an enlightening time here this morning that may change the way you see things for the rest of your life. For you see, as we look at September 11th, you cannot... Many would say, put God, all-loving, all-powerful, sovereign, in that picture of 9-11 and come out with the same good God that you claim. There's a lack of understanding. And I would say to you up front that I think in many cases, and some of you last week as you left thinking of our North Korean brothers underneath that steamroller, say, I don't know if I would have the courage of those men. I don't know that I would have the courage of the first responders, those who go into burning buildings, those who do what is opposite of our senses and every natural inkling that we have. And I pray that where you would plug in the word courage this morning coming in, that when you look at biblical suffering, you'll change that word from courage to love as you leave. For you see, while courage is a beautiful virtue, courage is not Christ-like love. No, there is a big difference. While courage is willing to go, Christ-like love is willing to stay. Where courage will respond to the facts, Christ-like love will respond in faith where courage will save, love will suffer. Where courage 
glorifies man. Biblical love glorifies God. While courage is good, love is God. And where there is an overflow, an abundance of love, courage is not needed. Daniel did not go into the lion's den because he had courage. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not go into the furnace because they had courage. The prophets did not take the abuse because they had courage. Paul did not take the persecution because he had courage. Stephen did not have his skull crushed with stones because he had courage. The people of God have a love for God that overflows and steps in where courage would stop. You cannot understand suffering without understanding the love of God and a love for God. I want to show you a clip on suffering that is the best I have seen. It's the best explanation in a comprehensive way of understanding biblical suffering. Please watch and listen closely especially to point number eight, as Mark Driscoll walks us through the top 10 misgivings and improper teachings on suffering that put people in the wrong place. You see, suffering is born out of love and it is a part of God's plan. And we must understand it if we are going to be all that God has called us to be. Please watch this. There are innumerable examples of bad teaching. I'll give you 10 ways in which the doctrine of suffering is mistaught thereby corrupting your instinct to use it for a witness. First, suffering is not avoided by you having a lot of faith. There is something called faith teaching, which is actually faithless teaching. It is unfaithful teaching, which says, if you have enough faith, you won't get sick and you won't be broke. You'll be healthy and wealthy. The logical conclusion is that if someone is suffering as a Christian, we should not comfort them, we should rebuke them because they are in sin, and if they had enough faith, they would be rich and healthy. Yet we see in Scripture, there are people who have great faith in God, like Job, Paul, and Jesus Christ, who is God himself. And they suffer. They also experience poverty, hardship, loneliness, and they weep. The sickest example I can give you from my own experience was a pastor that I knew of who taught, if you have enough faith, you will not get sick and you will be healthy. Until his wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he was left with a dilemma, should I change my theology, which is wrong, and comfort my wife, or will I hold to my erroneous theology and rebuke her for her cancer? And I grievously report to you that that man publicly rebuked his own wife for not having enough faith to beat cancer as she was dying. That is demonic. Number two, suffering does not automatically make you a victim. My fear is when I teach on suffering, all who have or are suffering will simply declare, I am suffering, therefore I'm like Jesus. No, you're not. (laughs) Jesus was without sin. You and I, we have tons of sin. And sometimes we suffer because of our sin. If you disrespect your boss, you will suffer unemployment. (laughs) If you're cruel to your spouse, you will suffer divorce. 
If you eat and drink too much, you will suffer physical ailment. And in those moments, you can't say, I'm like Jesus. You can't. You must say, I've sinned and I've reaped what I've sown. Three. Suffering is not necessarily a punishment for a sin. God can discipline his people and punish non-Christians for sin, but there is not always a correlation between suffering and a sin. There is an example in the Bible where a man is born blind, and some followers of Jesus ask him, is he blind because of his parents' sin or his sin? Jesus says, neither. He is blind that the glory of God might be revealed in him. God is doing something altogether different with that man. And his suffering is purposeful, not purposeless, but it's not the consequence of anyone's sin. Fourth, suffering is not to be pursued. The early church had some erroneous teaching where probably well-meaning Christians realized suffering purifies us and identifies us with Jesus. Therefore, they tried to suffer. They pursued suffering. Some of you do. You deny yourself godly pleasure. You deny yourself any sort of fun or joy. When there is a conflict or a difficulty, you insert yourself that you might have something that is painful so that you might use it to be sanctified. And while it looks holy, it's unholy, it's pride, which says, I do not trust God to bring into my life his divine appointments of suffering, therefore I will help him by pursuing my own. We would not encourage anyone to pursue suffering. What we are saying is, when it comes, either from the hand of God or through the hand of God, when it comes, suffer well. Suffer well. Fifth, suffering is not to be avoided at all costs. Some of you make your decisions based upon what will be the path of least resistance. What will cause the least conflict, least pain, least friction, least hardship, least suffering? Then that's what I'll do. And sometimes God calls us to hardship. Sometimes God calls us to pain. Sometimes God calls us to suffering. And had Jesus chosen the path without suffering, we would be dead in our sins. And he would not have left the comforts of heaven to come into the suffering of the earth. One author says it well. He says, I would rather have a bumpy ride to heaven than a smooth ride to hell. And I think he's right. Number six. Suffering is not to be excused because God uses it. I hear some Christians who are unrepentant, they will sin and then God uses it for something good and they say, well, I know it wasn't that great, but God used it so it must be okay with God. Give you one example. I was having a terse dialogue with a father who literally, growing up, beat his sons. And he said, well, they grew up to be good boys, and they're strong, and they're masculine, and they have dignity, and they have courage, and they have toughness. So, you know, the beating wasn't a bad thing. I said, that is a testimony to the goodness of God the Father, not to you as their father that you were a wicked, evil, sinful man who did an atrocious thing in beating his sons. And if you don't repent of that, you will go to hell because unrepentant people go to hell. And you are a man who's living an unrepentant life of all of your sin and you keep making stupid theological arguments like, well, God used it, so he must think it was fine. Just because God uses something, that doesn't justify the sin. That means that God is good even when we are bad, but that does not justify our evil. Seven, suffering is no excuse to passively allow injustice and evil. I've heard some people say, I know they're doing wrong and I know they're doing evil, but God is using it to teach me good things, so I praise God for it. No, you must also resist evil, pursue justice. I had this conversation with a wife whose husband was beating her. I said, what in the world are you doing remaining with a man who beats you and your children? She said, but God is teaching me so much through this and I'm growing in my relationship with Jesus. I said, well, praise be to God and be sanctified, but call the police. Have him arrested and thrown in jail. He too needs to be sanctified, not just you. We cannot allow people to continually sin 
in the name of our sanctification. We also must confront them and rebuke them and when necessary, take legal recourse. Eight, suffering is for us not an act of atonement, but an act of sanctification. God is not making us pay him back for our sin. When we sin, God is not making us come good on our debt. And some of you, I fear when you suffer, you think, okay, God is beating me now because I have sinned, and that's okay. If God beats me enough, maybe he will then love me. No. Jesus died for your sin. He's been punished in your place. God is not making you pay him back. We don't believe in karma. We don't believe in penance. We don't believe in purgatory. We believe in Jesus. Nine, suffering is not to be fully understood in this life. I have read a large stack of books on suffering and evil over the years, philosophical and theological in nature. And what I will tell you is this, there are many aspects of suffering and particular illustrations of human beings' lives that encountered much suffering that I simply will not answer because I have no answer. Other than to say God is good and I trust him. And when the Bible says that we know in part and we see in part, that's true. And that when we see Jesus, it'll all make sense. That's true. When Paul asks elsewhere his rhetorical question, who has known the mind of the Lord? He's not expecting any of us to raise our hand. But to simply say, not I. There are things that you will not understand regarding even your personal suffering until you see the face of Jesus. And 10th, Suffering is not beyond the goodness of a sovereign God. Suffering is not beyond the goodness of a sovereign God. That God ultimately uses everything. That God ultimately works through everything. That God takes even that which is horrendous and eventually because of his goodness and sovereign power uses it for beauty. We believe that, and if we cease to believe that, we lose all hope. Romans 8, 28, Paul says it this way. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In all things, God eventually works it out for his redemptive good. There's an illustration of this in Genesis 50, 20, where Joseph, looking at his brothers who sought to destroy him, said, what you intended for me was evil, but God used it for good and the saving of many lives. There must be a biblical understanding of suffering and God's love together. If there's ever going to be a walking through of this life that not only shines for Christ, but that is inspirational internally to you and to me as we walk with the king and externally as he shines and speaks through us, not just from the mountaintops, but from down deep, deep, deep in the valleys. And I would say to you, and I venture to say that if you're honest, you'll agree that whether it has been in your life or in the lives of others, when you see Jesus in the valley, oh, he shines brightest. Most of us, I'm sure, have had times and places in our lives where we have said, when seeing somebody with the bounce of Christianity, yeah, I'd bounce too if I had their life. I'd be happy too if I had your circumstance. But what about those times where you cannot for all your worth figure out how in the world that person can have a smile that big? How in the world can that person apparently be impervious to the pain that I know they are feeling. How 
can they walk so tall when I know that the world has taken them out at the knees? And when the answer is Jesus. Jesus. All of a sudden, the glory of God begins to do what only the glory of God can do. The Holy Spirit of God begins to do what only the Holy Spirit of God can do. And hearts and lives and eternities are changed forever. When you understand that the God of all creation, creator God, is also Abba, Daddy God. And that his love and his grace not only exist in the same room as suffering, but that his hand is sovereign over all suffering. When you can come to understand how this is so, you are ready to grow and go for the king. Listen to what God's word says in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. And listen to the both and of God's love and grace and his call for suffering on the part of his children, literally his children. God's word says, Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. The Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. If you back up to where we have been in the previous weeks, you know that that validation comes to those who are in Christ. And those who are in Christ are defined by those in whom the Spirit of God dwells. So those who are in Christ, validated by the Spirit of God indwelling you and me, are hereby pronounced to be children of God. Your daddy is the king if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit himself, not because you say so or I say so or public opinion is such or the Sunday school teacher says so or the pastor says so, but because the Spirit of God says that you are children of God. And if children, if in fact this is you, and note the qualifier because not everybody who claims to be his are his. We have developed in our family a passionate love for Jake. He is so close to an adopted son. But I'm here to tell you that if the chips are down and the division were to come and sides had to be taken and the law got involved and the truth and the fact of the matter was pressed. And his dad showed up at our doorstep and said, he's mine, I'm taking him home. As much as Jake spends time with our family, as much as we love him, he's not ours. As many as the people in our circles would assume at times, oh, that must be their son too. He's not ours. Those that have been adopted belong to the Father. All else, no matter how much time they spend in our houses, a.k.a. church buildings, no matter how much they look like, ours, no matter how much they sound like ours, no matter how much superficial stuff happens, at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is there are those that belong to one family and those that belong to another. And it is only those indwelt by the Holy Spirit that are the children of God. And I make this point to you because God makes this point to you. When he uses the word if, And later again says, in fact, if indeed, 
God's word says that if children, then heirs also. I asked you last week, what did you think of when you pictured a prince and a princess? If you are a child of God, you are a prince and princess of the king, of the king. Fellow heirs with Christ, think of that. You are co-heirs with Jesus. If indeed we suffer, if indeed we suffer, a qualifier with him. Now listen to the last words of verse 17. So that we may also be glorified with him. If we embrace the potential suffering, we may then and only then embrace the eternal gift of being glorified with him. Let me give you a few quotes on suffering, two from the present day and two from time past. D.A. Carson says this to show the empathy and the power of God. The God on whom we rely knows that suffering is what it is all about. And not merely as a God who knows everything about everything, but he knows by experience. The cross behind me is not decoration. It is inspiration. C.J. Mahaney says we need to be trained prior to suffering so that we may be fully sustained in suffering. Tertullian, one of my favorite of the church fathers, one of the early martyrs for the church, said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. How's that for a perspective on suffering? And what he was doing was paraphrasing Jesus himself, who said in John 12, 23 through 26, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Jesus says, it's time for me to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. How was Jesus about to be glorified? Through his suffering on the cross. Verse 25, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to the life eternal. Are you willing to make that exchange? Will you give your life here that you may have life eternal? You will see before we're done today, the great exchange. God offers his grace and glory for your sin and suffering. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, again encapsulating that passage. He said that suffering saints are living seeds. If and when we suffer for Christ, and as Driscoll pointed out, understand this, not all suffering is for Christ. But if and when our call involves suffering, we are living seeds. We are reflections of the king. I would say this to you this morning. You will not be willing to suffer for Christ out of courage. You can only go so far with courage. It will require from you, and I believe in large part this is why we see suffering as a part of God's plan. It is a refining fire. It helps to determine whether or not we truly love Christ or if we're simply looking to strike a deal and get from him that which we think he might be able to give in addition to what we can get out of the world. You see, a love for what you can get from him is not a love for him. And suffering oftentimes is the filter that will bring out the distinction. 
I want you to think, if you know your Bible, of all the times and places in Scripture where we're told to persevere, to endure, that it is those who are there at the finish that will know the prize of eternal life with Jesus the Christ. So many show up at the starting line. It's who's there at the finish that will be known to have been indwelt by the Spirit of God. I ask you, do you desire, do you love with a passion Jesus the Christ? Or are you just looking for a kick in church? I promise you that every church that is centered in Christ will have the power of the Holy Spirit. But not every church that has what appears to be a great surface pool of activity is powered by the king. But every church, like every Christian that is indwelt with the Holy Spirit, every one that is his, will represent him well, both from the mountaintop and deep in the valley. I want to show you the clip that I mentioned earlier that asks the question, what do you really want? What do you really value? What or whom do you really love? How you suffer and how you see suffering is directly related to how you answer that question. Do you really desire God? Watch this, please. I don't believe love is just doing the right thing. I don't believe love is just keeping commandments and I don't believe love is just being patient and kind and... That's what love looks like when it walks and talks, but that's not love. Love is passion. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a passion for God? Do you desire Him? Do you long for Him? Yes, we all go through times in which our hearts are dull. Yes, we go through times when we need to be encouraged. Yes, we all go through times when our eyes are mesmerized by things they should not be. Yes, we all struggle in that. But if someone were to look at your life, would they say, this person has a passion, not for ministry, not for missions, not for evangelism, but for God. That the sign of a genuine work of God in the heart is that you begin to hate the sin you once loved and to love the righteousness you once ignored. The question is not, do you agree with that or are you challenged? The question is, is that a reality in your life? Is it? Young, young lady, young man, elderly woman, elderly man, middle-aged man in the prime of life, is it a reality in your life? Are you continuing to grow in your hatred of sin and your love for righteousness? That's the question. So it's not a question of do you want to do the right thing or do you want to be moral or do you want to have a good life? It is this, do you desire Him? I hate preaching that goes something like this. You know, you got a wonderful life there, yuppie. You got a really nice house and a really nice job and you've got a really beautiful wife and you've got 1.25 children and, and you've got three cars and Subarus and Suburbans and you're just, you got a great job. You got a great life. Everything fits perfectly in place. You just lack one thing. You lack Jesus. That is the most disgusting thing you could ever say. What would be more appropriate to say is, sir, your life is nothing. It has no value at all apart from Jesus Christ. 
He is not some little accessory that a yuppie puts on top of his life as though it were cherry on the top of ice cream. You have Jesus and Jesus has you or you are barren and wasted and lost. So it's not a question of, do you want a better life? Do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to fix your marriage? Do you want all these things? No, do you want God? Do you desire Him? Everyone knows they're a sinner. They just don't realize how heinous and terrible that is. Nor do they want to let go of the very thing that they choose to drink down as though it were water. So you see, the question is not, do you recognize you're a sinner? The question is, sir, as I have been speaking to you, or maybe it's long-term discipleship over a period of time, sir, as I've been sharing with you and discipling you, what has God done to your heart? People come to me all the time and they say, I have a new relationship with God. And I say, well, do you have a new relationship with sin? Because if you don't have a new relationship with sin, you don't have a new relationship with God. Has God done such a supernatural work in your heart through the Holy Spirit that although prior to that you have lived a life of ignoring God, of hating God, you now see Him as esteemed above all things. And you desire Him above all things. God is infinite. Heaven will be an infinite chase, an infinite tracking down of the glories of God. But most don't want that. Even most who t attend the evangelical churches don't really want that, and I can prove it. They don't want it now. If you don't want it now, you won't want it then. Because eternal life does not begin with dying and going to heaven. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you. Know you. And that begins the moment He regenerates your heart and reveals to you God. This place ought to be a contradiction. First Baptist Church of Muscle Shoals ought to be a contradiction in every sense of the term. Our theology should be high, even it should be called academic and to some degree, people should think that the only thing we think about is theology and truth, and yet when the worship leader gets up here, this place ought to go wild. Do you desire Him? Do you desire Christ? You will never, ever be able to make sense of suffering, either in your personal life, on a tragic day of remembrance such as September 11th, or in all the struggles that you see across the globe. Suffering will never make sense when you approach it from the place of rationale and logic. We must come to this understanding through love. You cannot make sense of sin or suffering or sanctification or salvation through logic. It must come through a spirit-empowered, spirit-awakened heart and love. You see, now we are ready to read Romans 8, verse 18. Having seen that God said that his children have been called to embrace the potential to suffer. I told you last week that suffering is the incubation home of hope. It's the incubator of hope and the doorway to glory. Per our passage in God's word. Verse 18 says, for I consider 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For I consider, let me just give you a quick unpacking of that in the Greek. Considered for us is like contemplation, one of many options. In the Greek, this word speaks to a feeling of factual certainty, a certainty that comes out of calculation. Paul says, I have done the math. I'm telling you, I know that I know that I know that the suffering that happens here is not even worthy to be compared to the glory that is to come and be revealed to we, God's children. The glory to which is spoken here, and I want you to understand this, you and I, if we have been indwelt by the Spirit of God as biblical Christians, we have been promised Christ's glory as our own. We will be perfected for eternity by Christ, in Christ. We will not be gods. We will not have his power. But we have been promised his perfection. You will be perfected in glory, the glory of God. Is this not worthy of 50 to 100 years of potential struggle here? Is it or is it not? You see, to really get this, to really get this, love transfers this question out of the head and places it, transplants it into the heart. It is a heart question of love and not a head calculation of logic. This great exchange, it is considered and it is calculated in the head, no doubt, but it is consummated in the heart. Are you willing? Do you want? Will you worship the gift giver who says, the great exchange here for you, bought through the suffering of our Messiah, is the exchange is simply this, God's grace and God's glory to you in exchange for your sin and suffering. Are you willing? As you came in this morning, it's my prayer that each of you receive three things. If all went well, you should have received a piece of candy. I want to ask you, if I were to say to you right now, pull out your piece of candy. And if you're willing, I would be willing to make a trade with you. I'll make an exchange. For your piece of candy... I would be willing to give you a Chesapeake Bay banquet, rockfish prepared four different ways. All you can eat. And I said to you, would you like to make that exchange? Do you know in a room of this size, there would be a large percentage, no doubt, who would say, yeah. But do you know that there would be a significant portion who would say, no. No, thanks. Uh, I don't like fish. I don't care how you cook it. I don't like fish. You mean you wouldn't give one piece of candy for an all-you-can-eat Chesapeake Bay banquet of rockfish galore? And there would be many who would say, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make the exchange. Why? Because I don't like what you're offering I recognize that many would say I'm crazy, but you know what? You give me the choice. I would rather have my candy. Five minutes of joy. I like it. Gives me a little sugar boost. I'm a happy, happy guy with my little piece of candy. I recognize the value of the banquet. No thanks. Because it's not what I like. And it's not what I want. And as crazy as it sounds... And I know how it looks on paper when you get the facts out. I'm content with what I got. 
Many of you, I pray, also received a bandage. Every one of you should have received a band-aid. What if I were to say to you, I will make another offer to exchange every band-aid in the house for a miracle medicine. I'm not going to tell you what the medicine is applied to. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what it does to cure. And you need to know this, it comes in a giant needle. I'm talking like a turkey baster looking needle. Okay? One of these, one of these Nerf squirt gun kind of needles. But I promise you, it is a miracle medicine. Who wants to trade their Band-Aid for this miracle medicine that comes in a giant needle that you may not fully understand? The thought process in most minds would be simply this. I hate needles. <laughs> I hate needles. I'm just telling you right up front, I hate needles. And one medicine, probably good for one illness, what are the odds that I'm going to have the one illness that this miracle medicine will address? I don't think I'm sick. And, you know, I got this scratch down here. The Band-Aid will probably actually help. This is a good thing. I'll just keep this. I would say this to you, that if you don't think you're sick, you're not interested in the medicine. If you thought you were sick and believed you had the illness for which this miracle medicine applied and you were guaranteed to be healed eternally, you wouldn't care how big the needle was. You could have it attached to a truck and you would say, back that bad boy up, I'll take it. Here, take, take my bandage, I want the medicine. Your perspective matters. If you don't think you need it, you're not going to be willing to take or trade or engage in the process or exchange what little you have, no matter how big the offer of exchange. Let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you right now, if you received a penny when you walked in, each one of you, I pray, received a penny. I'd like you to pull out your penny if you're willing. And I want to make another offer here. Anybody who has your penny, I have some people here in the auditorium that are prepared to make an exchange with you. If you're willing to go through the time and energy, they'll give you a dime for your penny. Anybody that would like it, those that are here that are helping me, walk around. And if you see a hand that wants to make an exchange, that your penny for this dime, they're willing to do it right now. Anybody that wants to make an exchange, willing to go through the effort, we're going to take some time if, if, it, if it's required. I've put some time here. No, I really haven't, but I'm going to say that. All right. Um, if you want to make an exchange, your penny for a dime, we'll slow things down. We'll make some changes here. We'll endure the heat. We'll go further in line at the Cracker Barrel. But if you're willing, if, if you'd like, here's an offer we'll exchange. Anybody wants a dime for your penny? Okay, I'm getting a sense of the feel. Looks like we've got some exchanges that are happening. As I could tell, if I'm guessing, I'd say about 20% of you have made the exchange. Let me ask you, why is that? I would say this to you, 20% of you are those that have said, yes, I'm willing to break into the service. I can't believe you did that. I'm willing to slow things down. Uh, I don't really care because it was an offer. I don't care what everybody else around me thinks. I know I could hear the person next to me saying, oh, would you please, it's so hot in here. Come on, get us out of here. Some of you were willing to endure whatever that may have entailed to make the exchange. Why is that? You said, are you kidding me? That's 10 to 1. <laughs> That's a 10 to 1 exchange. Who doesn't make a 10 to 1 value exchange? Let me ask you this. Why did 8 out of 10 of you not go through the process? Why did 8 out of 10 of you here not feel it worth the effort or the time or the potential ridicule by the person next to you to make the exchange. Do you recognize this is a 10 to 1 street value? 
I mean, this is a fact, okay? We're not talking uh, feelings. We're not talking opinions. This is a fact. You were just offered a 10 to 1 value exchange in currency, okay? I'm not telling you that this picture that my son Gideon drew is 10 times better than this picture that my son Gideon drew. And in the end, you don't really have any value gain. I just offered you a 10 to 1 value upgrade. And 8 out of 10 of you said, no thanks. Why? Because you don't value the nine cents that is constituted in the gain. You say, okay, that's good math. You're right. What's the point? I have another offer. Those of you that held on to your pennies and weren't willing to go for a 10 to 1. I have an offer 1,000 times the value of your penny. I have a $10 bill right here. For anybody who is willing to make an exchange that involves total surrender of your life and the $10 to which I give you. The $10 I will give you, but you do not have the right to spend it the way you choose. You must make a commitment to, to consume, utilize, apply the $10 in a way that God would deem to be good. 1,000 times the value of what you have, but you must be willing to use the resource in a way that does not meet your selfish desires, but is approved by and endorsed by God in a way that he would say, well done in consuming it. And you must surrender your life, evidenced by a willingness to come up here and I have clippers. Can you hear that? They work. One of the ways you'll prove that you are willing to genuinely surrender your life is you'll allow me to sh shave your head in such a way that you're going to walk out of here being so ridiculed you won't believe it. And the commitment is that you are willing to surrender your life and apply that $10 in a way that God would say, well done. And you're willing to surrender all of your sense of rights to how you look and how people will treat you based on how you look for the foreseeable future. Would anybody like to come up and let me play with your hairdo for $10 in exchange for your penny, knowing that the $10 must be used in a way that only God would endorse, and that you must maintain this surrendered lifestyle in how you look, and what you do, and how you live for Christ. I see no hands. It may be because the lighting is bad, but I see no hands. I ask you, how can that be? I just offered you, yet again, a factual value increase of 1,000 times what you have. The answer is this, because the 1,000 times benefit is not of value to you personally enough to give up what it will cost. Ten bucks, you say. Not even close to being worth shaving my head. And by the way, I would not have done it clean like most people do. Ten bucks, not worth surrendering my rights, even if you say it's for righteousness. Your perspective matters. Let me ask you this. What if I were to say, and I almost had a $100 bill, but I didn't want to put these two together because I just think it's wrong. But what if I said to you, $100, 10,000 times the value of what you have. I will make an exchange 10,000 times fact, currency, spendable, if you are willing to come and pick up this cross, your cross, 
in the midst of, I would ask everybody in the room to get up and to begin to spit at you and kick you, ridicule you and call you names and to follow you home. And we would have to make some kind of an arrangement so that you would be followed for the rest of your life under this arrangement. Would you trade your penny for a hundred dollars, 10,000 times, for a life of cross-carrying, ridiculed, kicked, spit upon, perhaps tortured and murdered, knowing that at the same time, here again, you cannot spend that hundred dollars in the way that would be selfishly applied. You must be willing to commit to the same set of standards that applied for the dime, the $10 bill, and now the $100 bill, all in. Sadly, the reality is that most people in this world would say no. The vast majority of people say no. And sadly, the vast majority of people under the Western roofs of American churches also say no. Not with their lips. Oh no, they say yes with their lips. But their lives say no. Why? Because the value is not there. It's not worth it. Now I ask you, why is that? And my semi-rhetorical question is simply answered this way. Because the question is taken in through the head. And the equation is addressed and answered through logic. And where and when head and logic reign, you will not be able to understand biblical love and in their biblical suffering. Now I want to ask you this, if less than a penny, less than a penny is what you had and more than anything you could imagine is offered in exchange, would you make the exchange with Jesus? Would you accept from him his grace and his glory in exchange for your sin and your suffering? I tell you this, that if you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit and his love permeates who you are, you will. And if not, you won't. No matter how much sense something makes on paper, if I don't value it, no amount of paper value will change the direction of my life from the inside out. Only God can do it. Only the gift of his grace and his indwelling of us, the gift of his love, will inspire us and change us. The reason why so many deny Christ with their lives, regardless of what their lips say, is because they do not know the love of God. They do not possess the Spirit of God. There is so much religion getting in the way of relationship with Christ. There are so many counterfeits. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, just some verses from 10 to verse 18. He says, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. Therefore... We do not lose heart. 
Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all of our struggles. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's the love of God. It's the sovereignty of God that overshadows the suffering of we, his people. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to a cross, to a life and death of suffering because he loved you. The word of God tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And think of this, that he endured the cross. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He was so excited about coming to you in your sin with the opportunity to be saved and to give to you his glory forever. He was so filled with the joy of that gift to you, potentially, that he endured the suffering. When we are called to be Christians, Christ-like, Christ ones, he is our model. We are to so love him and love others that this biblical love flows out of us to the point where we are more than willing to suffer. We are more than willing as an extension of love. I tell you that real love redefines rational. Real love redefines reality in the power of God. This great exchange, God's grace and God's glory to you in exchange for your sin and your suffering. I ask you, brothers and sisters, what do you really want? Who do you really want? What do you really value? Who do you really value? What or whom do you truly love? John 17, 22 says, The glory which you have given me, Jesus speaking to God the Father, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Our children, the adopted children of God. So that they may be one just as we are one. The love of God says to us, by grace and glory, you may be called to suffer, but know it is a calling that will be born out of love. And you will be a light of love and truth if you shine Christ not only from the mountaintops, but from down deep in the valley. And all of God's people said, Amen. Lord, we come to you this morning and I thank you so much for your amazing grace. I thank you that you would be willing and wanting to share your glory. That you have not given us the promise of a great field trip after we die. But you have said to us that we will be heirs, co-heirs with Christ. His perfecting glory shared with us. No more pain no more suffering, no more hurt, that when we've been there 10,000 years, we'll just be getting warmed up. Just be getting warmed up for this eternal life of worship and praise and glory. Oh Lord, help us see suffering through your eternal love. Help us to understand the truth of our reality through the amazing grace 
that comes to us in and through your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.